What's up, everybody? Welcome once again to another episode of Blockbuster Mentality. I'm your host, Ben. Got another great show for you folks today, but First, before we get started, as always, please subscribe to us on iTunes, YouTube, anywhere you where you listen. Give us reviews, rate us. It helps us out a lot, believe it or not. Uh, as I said, we have a great show uh, in just a couple minutes here. Uh, we invite comedians Kevin Israel and Kevin Goatee on the show. Not only are they comedians, but they are also hosts of the podcast gutting the sacred cow which uh they were gracious enough to have us on as we discuss ghostbusters on that episode their podcast is they have on a guest who tries to destroy a beloved film and it's quite fun um and hey ghostbusters isn't that great people and Hey, I think we convinced them. So listen to that episode. Today, we have them on to talk about, and not destroy or anything, but to talk about the great uh, film Terminator 2 Judgment Day, obviously starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, Linda Hamilton, directed by James Cameron. Have a great conversation about it. And my last episode, I talked to Greg Fitzsimmons about uh, editing, and he's right. I'm going to keep my mess ups in there. You know, I, I stutter a lot. That's who I am. You know, should I have a podcast if I stutter and, you know, misplace words here and there and my mind goes blank? Sure. Why not? And if the guest, you know, wants me to take out something, I will. But hey, I, I you know, I have a life to live. I want the podcast to sound great. But hey, you know, editing takes a lot of time. I'm going to edit this clip in at the beginning. I'm going to put music and all that. But to edit out all the ums and the uhs, it's like, eh, it's natural. You know, it's natural. All right. But so, you know, if you if you hear that in this episode, it, it is what it is. All right. It is what it is. So hope you enjoy it anyways. So uh, that is it. Oh, and also can't believe I didn't mention this. Uh, Dave is back. Dave is back for this episode. Anyways, Dave, uh, my 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 precious, beautiful Dave, um, he joins me for this episode, and uh, he joined me for the uh, the Ghostbusters episode on their show as well. But anywho, enough of the chit chat. Here is our conversation on T two Judgment Day with Kevin Goatee and Kevin Israel, the guys from Gutting the Sacred Cow. Enjoy. How long have you guys known each other? Good question. Kevin, what is that answer? I mean, well, so, uh, well, we've I known know, each other. I, for, I actually remember the first time we met. Oh, person. I know it too. Yeah, it was Rich McDonald's roast. Yeah. I don't remember when that was, though. Um, probably six years ago, seven years ago. Wow. Uh, yeah. Maybe even more. But, I mean, Kev, Kev and I are both stand-up comics, and the stand-up comedy world is oddly very small and very large at the same time. It's It's a weird, amorphous entity, but... We always just kept crossing paths and we're friends with a lot of the same people. He, you know, we're both in Jersey. We did the New York, New Jersey scene. So on social media, we, we kept crossing and Kevin, I both talked a lot about movies and movie stuff. And we'd always go back and forth about whether we agree or disagree with whatever crazy assertions one of us made. And then Kev came up with this idea for this podcast and he posted looking for a co-host and i i happened to be in the market for a podcast <laughs> and, and i was like yeah let's do it and and he called me i posted it i hit like send and he called me like three minutes later and was like let's do it and it's wow. been i mean the the idea of the podcast is is brilliant and it's you know it's, it's just something so different and i think people really enjoy they enjoy enjoying it or they enjoy hating it either way did you guys start this post covid no, this was twenty uh, October twenty nineteen. Okay, so like right before, kind of yeah, a few months before. Uh, so yeah, at that at that roast is when you met met each other, and then you just kind of were just kind of acquaintances, and yeah. then the podcast came, and then it was like okay, we're we're in it now. We're in now. It. We're married. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very true. <laughs> That's what awesome. kind of what kind of weird stuff have you seen? Uh, you, a lot of people think they're funny, and I know that maybe stand up comedy might attract a, 
a different kind of person. You guys seem fairly well adjusted. Uh, but what kind of stuff have you guys seen o- over the years? The kind of the, the characters that have kind of come oh in and God. out of the scene. I will tell you right fucking now that we are by far and away anomalies. And why? Because we're not. We can look people in the eye and have conversations and not talk about being on meds. No, uh, we're not <laughs> autistic. That's another big thing too. And no, our parents aren't floating us money to rent ha- apartments in Bed Stuy and or Williamsburg. So. <laughs> The, the, no, and I'm serious because we also we're one of the few people that have corporate America day jobs and we know how business works. So we know that this just doesn't happen on a fucking wink and a prayer. You know, there's hard work in it, which is why one of the reasons I chose Kevin Israel to be my podcast host, because you guys fucking know that this shit is hard. It's not just eh, we will throw it to the wall and we'll see if it sticks. Nope. Like we're. I don't know how many hours we're each devoting to this fucking podcast. And I knew he was, you know, he would definitely put his fair share and then some in. But yeah, th- again, that's we are we are by far the anomalies. And it's so funny because guys and girls like us all flock together. And when they're also I say I also came up with this. There are doers and there are talkers. We are doers and 90 ish percent of everybody else are fucking talkers. And we can sniff you out in a minute or less, which you are. Yeah. So, the, and there's, yeah. I mean, there's in the stand up comedy attracts a variety of people. Oh, but yeah. a lot of times those people p- spit. Uh, fit into specific like phylums like you have the very socially awkward people who can only interact through a microphone and then the minute they get off stage they like they they just shut down and then you have the people who are like angry uh, at the world and they get it out by being on stage but they actually are that angry inside and they can't (laughs) express it any other way than by being on stage it's a lot of it's a lot of like i need to talk about my problems on stage. This is uh, my therapy is the yeah, fucking right. line that sends us into a tizzy. Right. But I'm putting a comedic spin on it. So, you know, right. it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it makes it seem a little hidden, you know, yeah. it's, uh, so yeah, I mean, you guys are based obviously in New Jersey. I mean, have you guys ever tried to go out to LA, uh, or is that in the works? Like what, what's, uh, what are your thoughts on people who go to LA for, for this kind of stuff? Uh, I have done work outside the tri-state area. I, Vegas, I've done several times. Uh, I've done stuff in Florida, but not crazy. My thing with LA is I, I don't know why some people, unless you're into acting, you don't go to you don't go to LA for comedy. You go to LA for pilot season or TVs or movies or shit like that. You come to New York for comedy. You go to LA for acting. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to LA until LA's knocking my fucking door down. Going, you, we're buying your shows because I have I've developed a few TV shows. We're buying your shows. You need to be here. Then I will go. And I don't want to listen the way California is right now with the insane taxes, the insane homeless people, the insane whatever the fuck else is going on out there. I, I don't want to go unless it's absolutely 100% fucking mandatory. So that you that was usually what everyone thought is, oh, I'm going to go make it in New York, which make it in New York. You need to, that is by far and away the tallest order known the man is making it in, in, to, in New York. And if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. Uh, someone said that. I forgot who. Yeah. Just a guy from around the corner in Hoboken sung that. Yeah, it was a guy <laughs> who made it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's who it's, it. it's true. I've, I've done I've done some work on the road around the country. I've actually been I've done a series of shows in Michigan. Um, oh. I've done out Midwest, out down the down south up north um and it's all i mean you know you get it's fun i i hate traveling just as a person i mean i'm going on vacations nice but i don't like traveling for work or traveling for travel's sake i hate staying in hotels i hate flying i just hate the whole process of it 100 home i'm such a homebody so to me like stay being able to stay in the tri-state area and perform and do this is is optimal for me I've never had any desire to go out to California and people always, I like my wife has a bunch of friends out in California and they're like, Oh, if you come out, you know, we can get, we know people at clubs and stuff. And I'm like, I like, it's not going to like the thing with comedy is your chance of making it in comedy. As far as like, that's what, that's how you suddenly cross over is so slim and infinitesimal and has nothing to do with how funny you are or how much time you put in. It has to do with, on the right night at the right time, the right yeah. person happens to be there and happens to be looking for someone who says, you know, butt face the way you say butt face. And he goes, oh, <laughs> I'm going to do something with you. But if those elements all don't come together, you're never going to make it that way. So yeah. like like we comics are always looking for like like stuff like this, like like podcasts or YouTube. Sure. Like there's 
you've got to have these other things happening. And it was also something I was never interested in doing. Like I never wanted to be a YouTuber. I never wanted to be like, I didn't want to do a podcast unless I've, and I've done a bunch of podcasts, but I never got into it. I love this concept. I love working with Kevin. I love movies. So this is, this is fun, but it, comedy is just comedy is a very strange animal, especially now. Oh, I'm sure. And, yeah. and I will say the making it part, when we say making it, we don't mean like fucking Chris Rock, uh, uh, Kevin Hart. We mean paying your bills and making your living only from comedy and nothing else. That's what we mean by yeah. making yeah. it. That's what I would call this this podcast if I were able to quit my day job and just uh, just uh, be able to support myself and my family on this podcast. I th- I think I'd make I'd made it as a podcaster. Yeah, you know I'm not uh, known worldwide, but you know, but uh, you know maybe someday that'll come. But uh, um, now I, I always like to ask this with, with uh, comics is. Uh, has it helped your material or hurt your material? Not now. I'm not talking. Has it helped your, you know, um, ability to get gigs? Obviously, that's been affected and and things like that. But like, has your material improved? Do you think since since all this happened? Since, since COVID, COVID or, or the podcast? The COVID, COVID, yeah, just like the quarantine and not being able to physically go to gigs. Like you had more time to kind of work on your material. Do you think that's been a blessing in disguise so my answer is gonna be different than kevin i know that my answer is no my material has gotten worse because what i did with covid was i looked at it from a different standpoint like kevin just perfectly put it when you do you know with comedy it really it's a fucking lottery ticket and even that lottery ticket it may be a winning lottery ticket maybe a few dollars yeah it's not a fucking multi-million jackpot so i said i have way more control over the shows i've created as well as this podcast. And when COVID hit, don't get me wrong, I missed out on a lot of shit, fun shit, whatever. But I actually was thankful for this COVID thing to hit. Why? Because I took that time and Kevin and I took that time, excuse me. We nailed down all the menial behind the scenes grunt work bullshit for this podcast in that time. Yeah. So when everyone's like, there's no comedy, there's no nothing, I go, you know what? Everyone goes, well, if I had six months off, we got fucking <laughs> seven, eight months off. Uh, I'm, a field, I'm, a, I'm a medical field rep by day. I went, I was home, was it March 17th till day after Labor Day when I came back in the field. I, and I work in Manhattan. So I was out six months, pretty much six months. So what wow. I did was I said, I am going to fucking get this shit so up and running and I dare say for a podcast, it's not even up a year and a half. We are way ahead of people who have been out a year, less than a year and a half from our standpoint. So, but because of that, my material has taken a hit. I do some Zoom shows here and there, but if I'm going to make it in quotes for me, it is the podcast. It is the shows. It is not stand up. Stand up has now become secondary for me. If anything, the, sh- the podcast will get me to a point where we build up a huge enough audience where we're, we're, we've already done one live show. We're going to, we'd love to do live shows around the country where we watch films in person and then we do a podcast episode there. We would also love to say, fuck it. We've got a huge audience. We can rent out the, we could do a theater show where Kevin and I can do stand up and fucking really go double dip that way. So to answer your question, a long winded way, my material has taken a backseat to this, but the podcast has, uh, has soared, soared ahead. Because uh, Kevin is sorry, Kevin Israel. Have you also become less funny over COVID? Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? It's it. the set. I mean, I, I did a pretty good. I mean, I did as good a job as you can maintaining some kind of performance schedule during all of this. You know, I, I was getting up a couple times a month, but comedy is a muscle. And I mean, I, we're typically working out every weekend, at least. And going from that to maybe once, twice a month, you just it atrophies and you feel it. And it just you and even if you're writing like I wrote stuff during covid because you can't not like you you stuff come up. I mean, posting stuff on Facebook, you couldn't not write about what was going on in your life at that time. Yeah. But the problem is there's thousands of other comics who are writing the exact same shit. <laughs> We're all going through the exact same thing and experiencing all the same fucking shit. So 
there's like there's literally it's like it's like the the start of the New York Marathon. There's like thousands of comics at the gate just being like, I got to get my material out first right now, because if I, everybody else is going to say the same thing. <laughs> so it it definitely it didn't help stand up comedy. It didn't help my my material. And because I just I can't get up as much. You can't practice as much. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, you write something and you think it's hysterical and then you get up on stage and you say it a couple of times. And you're like, oof. <laughs> this not work. This is. And then you either find the funny in it or you just ditch it. But you got to you've got to do a joke. You got to do a joke at least ten times before you really know if it's funny or not. Where the funny is. I mean, maybe you get lucky and everybody laughs and it works the first time. But typically, it takes you got ten, twenty times before you really get the funny out of a joke. And now, if you're only performing once or twice a month, that's that's the long process. Yeah. So it's I you know. But to Kevin's point, it gave us a lot of opportunity to grind it out on this on the podcast and and build it up to what it is, where it is now. So that that was great. But I've I've been getting up a little more now and I definitely feel the rust and it sucks. It really yeah. sucks. Yeah, yeah. But the, the show is great. And uh, Ben and I made an appearance uh, on one of them. So I want everyone to check that out. You guys are <laughs> definitely rocking, rocking a great thing. You guys have some, you. Something, something good going for sure. Yeah. Appreciate uh, it. Thank you. Obviously, we're going to get to the title of the episode here, but uh, real quick, uh, just so people who don't know, uh, you guys are on Gutting the Sacred Cow. First of all, wanna, uh, I'm sure you get this question all the time, where the name comes from, and then if you could just explain uh, explain what the show is. Gutting the Sacred Cow, I, I came up with that. It's just, so the idea was this. I, I've done several podcasts to minimal success at best. I would say, Kevin, probably the same applies to you. And I came up with an idea for a movie co- movie podcast where we invite guests to come on to pick a film that they find overrated or hate. But here's a problem that's been done by ten th- tens of thousands of fucking podcasters where they all sit around and go, oh, Star Wars is better than Empire. No, fuck you. Empire is better than Star Wars. No, fuck you both. Jedi is better than both of them. And it's the same dumb, same dumb circle jerk. So I said, no, let's let's do it differently where we invite guests to pick a film they find overrated or hate. But here's the twist. You have to pick a film that meets one of these criteria. Widely beloved critically acclaimed or financial success because you can't come in and dunk on Friday the 13th part eight. We all know it sucks besides other <laughs> podcasts where you do stuff like that. It takes skill to come on and say, you know what? I got the balls to come on and say, you know what? Fuck you. Godfather two overrated. You know what? Ghostbusters overrated. You know what? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not Sh- Schindler's list. Yeah. Schindler's list overrated. Yes. We have someone coming to do Schindler's list <laughs> in two weeks. Kid you not. People. And I'm a Jew, so wow. this is awkward. yeah, that's yeah. gonna be wow. That should be yeah. interesting. <laughs> so the goal, the goal is to convince us, like, to have the unpopular opinion and really go in the sacred cow, being films that we all have loved or made a ton of money or won awards, to gut that sacred cow to see who can do it and convince us. And as Kevin has says many a times, this film, this podcast has ruined a lot of our films for us because you go back and go, this person picks a film and you're like, wait, fuck you. That film's great. We rewatch it every single time. And they go, oh, there are more problems with this than I remember. Yep. That critical but, uh, eye. Yeah. It's, that's a tough one. Once, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it's, it's kind of the way you, you see go. movies going forward. It's just, right. it, yeah. But it's equally as fun, though, to have people on to say, you know what, yeah, this movie sucks, and we love it, and especially a few of them. We're like, no, you're a fucking moron. This film is brilliant <laughs> or perfect. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Um, now, so again, but but the 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 name, like, what made you think a sacred cow? Because no one else had it, and it's something that stands out. And if you see yeah. our logo, it's a picture of both of yeah. us cutting open a cow. Because, well, again, to really get into the nitty gritty, as you know, in India, cows are sacred. So I said, let's get something besides like movie talk or circle jerk with craft beers talking about films or, you know, just or, shit like I want or, something that's gonna stand or blockbuster out. mentality, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, quick, quick, quick I, I'm going to forget this because my ADD is a motherfucker, but definitely ask me the right down the question about to ask me i have to ask you guys this now though did you guys watch the blockbuster the blockbuster doc on netflix yet i actually haven't and they keep don't 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 don't. it's 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 one of the few films that are short but drag it's like (laughs) they could have they could have told that story in 45 minutes but they told it in an hour and 25 oh i saw you post about that yeah oh Oh, yeah yeah yeah. it's it's don't bother i'm telling you don't bother watch 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 the first 45 and then tap out and go i'm good and you are good (laughs) The last blockbuster is that what it's yep. called? Yep, yeah, that's it. Yep. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. That's Kevin disappointing. Smith, I think makes an yep. appearance. Yeah, I think they DM'd us once about 
maybe doing a review on it and I never uh, never responded. Yeah. So Oh, you can um, tell them it sucks. <laughs> I could, yeah. I'd be like, nah, it sucks. Can't do it. Yeah. We, 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 can't, we, we can't get the blockbuster mentality, guys. All right, fine. We we'll, go, yeah. we'll go get Brian Posehn and Doug Benson. <laughs> um, so, obviously, the uh, like I said, the title of the episode, we're going to be uh, breaking down the 1991 uh, action film Terminator 2 Judgment Day from James Cameron. Starring a little guy known Arnold, known as Arnold Schwarzenegger, got Linda ha- Linda Hamilton. I uh, I edit out all my stuttering, FYI. So, <laughs> <Not possible. laughs> uh, uh, wise move. <laughs> I'll never do a live show ever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> introducing Edward Furlong. Now, uh, Kevin uh, KG, yes, uh, I had uh, emailed you a uh, a list of movies to choose from. Sometimes guests have movies off the top of their head, but uh, yeah, you wanted a list, which a lot of guests want as well. Uh, so, out of all the movies I sent you, why why uh, why did you guys pick this one? It was between this and Aliens, so you're going to figure out real fast that uh, I'm a Cameron guy, uh, except for Avatar, which is on our old podcast, Cutting the Sacred Cow. No, uh, but um, <laughs> Terminator 2, I mean, I don't know, we can do notes, we'll just weave in and out. This film is, as, and Kevin and I have it also on our podcast, we talk about films that we feel are bulletproof. Goodfellas, Shawshank, Back to the Future, um, Empire, The Matrix, I'm throwing Terminator 2 on that list of impervious films. This film is a goddamned American classic. I can't find anyone to give anything less than a stellar review of this film. I saw it when it came out in the theater. My parents saw it first because my parents were a little bit constraints with the uh, R ratings. And they said, oh, we'll, we'll see it first and then we'll let you know if you can go see it. And it's funny, my mother goes, they saw Silence of the Lambs. She goes, you're not seeing that till you're 17. <laughs> but Terminator 2 passed the bill. They said, go for it. And boy, oh boy, we also talk on the podcast, films that have changed us after you walk out of them. The Matrix being one, the one for me. This is in my top three. Terminator 2, I walked out of and go, holy shit, that was a religious enlightenment was this film. So that is why I yeah. love Terminator 2. It is my brother's favorite film. I just bought him a framed fucking T2 poster for his man cave downstairs for one of his Christmas presents. An absolute goatee family classic, quotable from top to bottom. And I don't know how many iconic action scenes that we'll be getting into, I'm sure, <laughs> later on. But yeah, this film is a goddamn classic. And I will stand on a hill and I will execute anyone who says otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> literally he will execute <laughs> right uh, did uh kevin israel did you uh did you have a say in what we were gonna do or did uh, did kg just pick i have a terrible memory so okay. i want to say that at some point he texted me and said hey here are the couple of the movies they wanted to choose from and i i think i i agreed with terminator too but okay i this, so it's funny that you guys did Ghostbusters and I told a whole story about how I saw that in the movie with my sister. Like that was the one my my old sis, my big my big sister took me to see it. And that's something that always stuck out in my head. This was one of two movies in my life. My father took me to see. Really? What was the other one? My uh, <laughs> Godzilla 1985. OK, <laughs> um, that was and that was purely like I made him take me to see that. <laughs> um, oh, I, I'm sorry. You know what? He saw Batman with me, too. OK. This, but this this one really stuck out because he wanted to see this movie too, and it's I hadn't seen it in a while, and on rewatch I was really surprised by how much I still enjoyed the entire movie. Like every scene in the movie has something to offer. Like there's something memorable, something fun or cool or exciting or or graphically violent which i i I forgot how violent the movie is yeah (laughs) that stands out about each scene like there's no dead space in this movie it's just every 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 scene just builds on each other and builds on each other until it gets to this this great climactic fight it's it's i totally i second what kevin said that this is this is bulletproof yeah definitely and uh you know uh you know obviously this uh dave did you uh when you found out we were doing this movie what what were your preconceived notions well i was intrigued because i I didn't see this in the theater and, and i think i saw the tv cut 
like 50 times. And I was thinking, like, how many times have I actually watched the theatrical R-rated version? And I think it's just a handful. Uh, so watching it uh, before before we, you know, we always uh, do be a good podcast host and <laughs> watch the movie before we talk about it. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think this is, I think fairly this is i think this is james cameron's best movie i think there was certainly you might might say aliens or something like that but i, I don't i think i don't think there's anything else uh, that i would say is better certainly not titanic we can go all, <laughs> we can go all over that and i actually uh kevin i actually like avatar so i will admit to that <laughs> i don't know if, that, if that's true, gonna be a slaughter. True, li- true lies is good not great but you're right it's 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 t2 and aliens and then it's a nice steep drop off yeah, but uh, hey, so- at least uh, Kevin Arnold's in it, so you know <laughs> you got that going for it. You know, <laughs> but I was excited. I haven't seen this one in a bit. Uh, but yeah, this one seems to be like the, the movie that was was always on TV, at least to, to like on TNT or TBS or something like that. So I, I've caught like a million bits and pieces of it uh, to sit and actually watch the whole thing straight through the theatrical cut. It was it was a nice experience. I watched a theatrical cut too. I'm sorry, a director's cut. I watched a director's cut for our podcast. I um I, I for for this podcast or you have you guys done this show on your uh, done this movie on your podcast? No, no one oh, no okay. one has the balls to bring it up. But no, I I rewatch. <laughs> listen, you guys, let's watch. You know, we're doing T two. Go well. It gives me excuse to watch T two for the honest to God. I mean, it's got between fifty and hundred times for me. I've seen this <laughs> so. So is this good. is it safe to say this is your favorite Arnold film? It's this in Commando, and I give this. And Kevin Israel starts nodding already. He's like, "Fucking a right, it is." <laughs> yeah, it, it's these two are my two favorite. I, I mean, and Terminator is great too. The original Terminator. Oh yeah, Commando. Yeah. We did an episode on Commando with uh, actor Dan Franco. It was a, 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 a hilarious hour and fifteen minutes. <laughs> Just, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Commando is great. Gloriousness. Predator it's, is my favorite Arnold movie. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, Predator's up there for me. T, I, I don't know. I, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about w- what we favor more, T2 or the first one, uh, a little later on. But, uh, but yeah, let's, let's kind of get into this thing. I mean, it, uh, starts off with that, uh, you know, classic Sarah Connor voiceover, uh, obviously Lin- Linda Hamilton playing her. And uh, we see the destruction of L.A., the the skeletons uh, all over the place and these uh, the the Terminators uh, from from Skynet all walking around. I mean, it's just brilliant how they do it. And then you see the uh, the older John Connor kind of leading the charge. And then uh, and then what, what gets to I think yeah, right away it gets to Arnold back in. Well, his hold on, naked, hold on. I, 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 have a, I have I have a note for you. The, <laughs> the, the op- the, oh, many of them. The opening scene. I'm going to go out and the limb and say this is the third coolest laser sound effects ever. <laughs> yeah. Third. Yeah. What number one? The other two? number one. Well, we have to actually, know. <laughs> yeah, number, no, actually, I'll go backwards. Number two. The Cobra lasers from the G.I. Joe cartoon. Oh, oh okay. hey, number one better be what I think it is. TIE fighter lasers. No, oh, damn it. No, what? yeah, TIE fighter. Optimus the Prime's answer. rifle. Mm. I would say Mega. I would take I, I would take Megatron's rifle over I, Optimus I Prime. I think Optimus Prime's rifle had a more distinct sound. Uh, and I, I always remembered loving the sound. And I can't picture it right in my head right now. But I remember always thinking that that was what I would want a laser rifle to sound like. The, I think Megatron I, was more succinct and, and unique. But the okay. the correct answer is Tie Fighters. So I mean, <laughs> thank you. So, that, yes. That's why it's number one. So let's be yeah. Honest. So that is the correct answer. I, uh, well, hold I, the notes aren't all like that, right? Uh, well, well, the next note is about the ginger John Connor's friend. So continue, please. No, no, you continue. You're hosting the show now. What? No, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I so shall the not ginger, do that. The ginger is he from uh, Salute Your Shorts? Is that the? Is that? Uh, wasn't that, that Pete? Wasn't that? I was gonna say. Wasn't that? You know, who would have thought Pete, the guy from Pete and Pete, was would be would be in less dire straits than the guy who played John Connor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who, the redhead was in a TV show in the eighties, though. Yeah, I, can't I think it was, it was Salute Your Shorts, wasn't it? You, you, you might be right on that. I, I, thought, I thought it was Pete and Pete, but I, again, I didn't do my research. <laughs> what, what are the gingers from Nickelodeon? You know, you know <laughs> one of the gingers. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he's in it right away. We 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 meet John Connor, who's this 
foster kid because apparently Sarah Connor is in this men- mental institution. He's got foster parents. Uh, she wants him to clean his room. He basically says, fuck off um, <laughs> in so many words. <laughs> you know, he's totally disrespectful. And this is the guy that's going to lead the resistance in the future. Um, but hey, you, you know, you got to you got to, you know, start with someone who's who's already strong, you know. But uh, the the before that, though, is Arnold classic na- naked uh stance <laughs> they 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 always perfectly you know put up the knee to cover the genitals yeah wh- and, why uh, are they gonna hide that because you know, nobody no- wants to see his little <laughs> well, they, they, affected penis <laughs> they don't but I, I always wonder about those scenes in movies like it's it's been in several where the 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 knee just lifts up and yeah i'm wondering like does the cameraman say like uh no i got a little ball action there if you could just lower it a little bit uh yeah because uh, i'd have a fair dangle i don't know about you guys <laughs> well, good someone, for you yeah someone geez. congratulations Someone yeah, humble Twitter, brag, I guess. Someone posted on Twitter the footage of him doing that scene from behind the cameras. He's wearing like a little like neon orange and green speedo. Uh, oh, yeah, they, of course yeah, they he typically is. put some kind of <laughs> ball strap on. protector. So if you so if you're gifted like Dave is, it doesn't dangle <laughs> below. <laughs> that was the most, that was the best humble brag of Dave and that he slings dick like that. That's cool. That was me. It would have been dragging on the ground. It would have taken <laughs> me to stand up. Such a problem. My dick gets wet when I pee. It's horrible. God, You're getting asphalt burn. I got a boner. Road like rash. Out from blood. <laughs> You've got gum on your dick again. Oh, <laughs> cut that. Right. That's the show, folks. Um, <laughs> Dave's balls, uh, but uh, no, yeah, I mean it's a you know similar, obviously, to the Terminator, uh, the first Terminator scene, and uh, yeah, he shows up to the bar, needs an outfit, obviously, you know, the guy he steals his outfit from, similar size, kind of shorter, uh, you know, it's uh, it was well, like all right, I guess yeah. that works. <laughs> that scene where that guy gets thrown onto the griddle. Awesome. Sticks in my head so clearly for some reason. Yeah. The idea of landing face first on a hot oh. stove and then he puts his hands like to make it worse. Yeah. And you, you go and you hear and like I feel that scene almost more than anything that happens in this movie. <laughs> yeah, it is rough. It is rough, that's for sure. Um, and then uh yeah, so yeah, we, we get we get all that, you know, the class instead of uh the late great Bill Paxton, we get just a no named no named actor who uh he steals uh he steals his uniform, I guess you could call it from clothes, your um, boots and your motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Did he take uh, his underwear? That's what I want to know. I mean, does he need that's that's another thing. Maybe maybe these uh they don't have genitals. So maybe he's not even covering <laughs> up any. No, 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 what? they that's do. A... They I think they do because they have to pass as humans in all shapes and forms. Uh, okay. There we go. We that's got my guess. Uh, KG. Uh actually, uh, we <laughs> got, uh... <laughs> You see if you really do the zoom in on the dong, you can see yeah. some <laughs> some shaft and it's quite magical. <laughs> it's kind of like Dave's, just way way smaller. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what can you do? <laughs> Skynet ain't got shit on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um then, uh, which we get. Um, By the way, we're, we're not getting through this movie, so no, <laughs> we're we're, we're, we're not at all. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I just want to bring out. So what do you, what do you guys think of? Uh, oh my goodness, I can't think of the actor's name. Uh, not Rob. Yeah, Robert Patrick. Robert Patrick. Uh, he he plays the guy who was a Arnold Schwarzenegger's essentially character in the first one, the one to go and kill Sarah Connor. And this one, he's trying to kill John Connor. What are you guys thoughts on Robert Patrick as, uh, as this character? Randomly. I actually met him. I haven't met a lot of celebrities. Oh, this is what I like to hear through uh, some circumstance in my professional life. I got a chance to like hang out with him for a couple of days and he's a, uh, He's a very cool, very serious guy who is a he's a very he he he's one of those people who like he comes off like, oh, he's just a normal guy. And he's like, cool. But I was sort of on the set of a movie he was doing and he turns this acting thing on 
and he just becomes a completely different person. I assume a lot of like real serious actors do that. Really? But it was just it was just really weird to watch. And the whole time that I didn't want to be that guy who was like, I loved you in Terminator. Like <laughs> you shaped yeah. like so much of my opinions of movies. And I just I never said anything. I have I, I did manage to get a picture with him. But he, uh, I mean, I, I took a selfie was, and everything, but you know, <laughs> I, yeah. Well, and I, I think he might have even, he's like, he's like, hey, if you want to get a picture, and I was like, yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm uh, glad you're the one that asked. <laughs> I thought, especially young, he had almost like an alienish look to him. Like yeah. the way he's, his, his face didn't look like a real human face. So I thought it was so perfect for this part because he looked human, but like just a bit off, like just a bit like, Nobody really quite looks like that, even though he does. I thought he was he was just perfect for this. Yeah, very well yeah. cast. Yeah. And I remember him from the X Files as well and kind of the latter years. He did okay. Um and then I, I don't know I'm trying to place him where I saw him. He was like a grizzled guy with like a beard or something, and he did well, but yeah. I so know. I would go up to him if I ever saw him in pop and go, I loved you in strip tease, man. You were amazing <laughs> in that film. <laughs> he also was in the he also because I rewatched this over coronavirus. He also was in The Sopranos. Do you yes. guys remember that? That's what yeah. I was going to bring up, too. Yeah. Go ahead. But yes. Yeah, he was the guy who's Tony Soprano's, I guess, high school buddy. He got him into a card game. He went down 100 Gs, and then they got into the sporting goods store because he had to he had to pay him off somehow, and they got a piece of that, and they started doing shit in there, and then he got uh, divorced, and his kids left him, and uh, it's a sad sack story. But, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, he plays such a great villain in this movie. Like, he's perfectly yeah. cast. He's so menacing and everything. And then you see him in that Sopranos uh, arc, you know, and he's just so pathetic. And, you know, he's like, come on, let me uh, let me in the, in the game, you know? He's just trying to – he's this uh, uh, gambler who's just a compulsive gambler and just uh, can't stop. And, yeah, he's just pathetic pathetic in uh the sopranos i mean he does it well obviously he plays it well but yeah it's just so weird seeing that comparison from this to that um but uh you should go up to you should go up to go is wolfie really fine (laughs) (laughs) is he really fine (laughs) um yeah because i mean he's he's this new kind of tech they have in the future where he's liquid metal he can he can become other people he can kind of shape shift and everything make uh swords out of his own hand and everything um and take on other identities yes exactly and uh yeah so i mean that's you know right away a threat Um, i always felt like that came about like this whole movie came about because some cgi tech (laughs) said to james cameron hey look what i can do now i can make this liquid turn it and he's like holy shit i'm making a whole movie about this because that's amazing because at the time this movie came out that technology was mind-blowing that's oh, absolutely. the scene where he yeah. drips out of the uh he uh with the into the helicopter. Yes. Is, yes. was like such an epic special effects scene that like lingered in everybody's mind. Like, we'd never seen anything like that before. And Definitely. I, I feel like James every time James Cameron saw that being like as it was being developed, he just blew his load in his pants. He's like, <laughs> this is be the See, best. Oh my God. I thought I thought this scene for him that just stood out to me was when he fucking came up from the floor in the yeah. uh, in the mental hospital where he just came out of nowhere and sucked up that I was like holy shit man this is it's the fucking game changer it's yes exactly what yeah. it absolutely so, so i have to s- i have to ask uh no well I, to your point uh k i uh i mean this is a 1991 movie i mean this could have easily been a 2001 movie and looked oh, yeah. just as good and we and we talk sometimes about movies that hold up uh this one holds up extremely well it it really does not look old like at all um but about the liquid metal stuff i mean w- I would say, just to be a little bit critical, even though I love this movie and I think it's great, I think it was a bit overused. And I think the fight scenes, like, you know, we kind of get it. And I don't know, maybe it's just for a 91 audience that's continually blown away through the whole uh, going through the entire movie. But kind of watching it again, I'm like, yeah, I kind of get it. Like, he, you shoot him and then he, he kind of separates and he comes back together kind of a thing. Uh, was it was it overdone or was it was it just right? <laughs> Oh, I definitely think it was. I definitely think he went all crazy on it because the minute he saw that you could do this, he'd be like, "We're going to put this 
yeah. in 18 <laughs> separate action scenes. We're going to have him blown in half. We're going to have his head blown in half. We're going to have a hole thrown, <laughs> blown through him. He's going to melt. He's going to he's gonna freeze. He literally, literally, they did everything with that liquid metal aspect that you possibly could. Like they chat around at a table and we're like, what what happens? You now you now you now you write it all down. We're putting it all in the movie. And, you know, it, it, it did feel like a little much. And I Kevin and I talk about this a lot. Like, I think now that we have like all these Marvel movies where there's so much going on and there's all these different threats and different having a movie where it's just this one guy chasing this one group of people and they're just trying to survive almost <laughs> seems like dull now. <laughs> <laughs> but this you're right this movie holds up in it and it and it pulls that really kind of simple like they're just trying to survive and keep away from this guy like that's kind of the point of this movie see I, this is to me this is like cameron it's like any of us you find an eight and a half at the bar what do you do you fuck the shit out of her for the next week and a half <laughs> two weeks nonstop. i mean <laughs> breakfast lunch and dinner and that's what he did with this but you know what i think it worked i had no problem with him going crazy with it the floor the helicopter going through the jail bars getting blown in half at the very end uh, uh getting blown apart and the reforming all that shit all every single of those aspects it fucking worked for me in spades and it worked for me again Saturday morning when, when I rewatch this puppy. It's still yeah. just chef's kiss. Still fucking perfect. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 great. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like uh, with, uh, K, you know, uh, uh, I still am messing up your. I'm just K.I. K.G. K.I. There. Boom. Figured it out. Uh, well, like K.I. said, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's. Like he just, you know, found out about this technology, put it in the movie, and it was just like, all right, let's keep using it, keep using it. So for me, it was a little overused, <laughs> but again, it's still awesome. It's, it's, you know, it's great. You know, it's, it's technology you hadn't seen before, and it's still like, it's still menacing, and it's just like, okay, this guy will not go away. I feel like Austin Powers when he's, yeah. I forget if it was the first one, he's, but he's just like, why won't you die? You uh, know what it immediately said, <laughs> made me think of in the first, the first X Men movie. When the congressman gets turned into a mutant or whatever, oh, and he's yeah. standing at the bars and he slips through the bars. Oh. I remember even thinking in the theater, they did that in Terminator like 10 years yeah. ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you got to think that, yeah, took inspiration from that. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you know, Terminator 1 ends with kind of, you know, uh, Linda, ha Linda Hamilton, you know, on the lamb, you know, kind of, you know, she knows this event is coming eventually uh, after she just birthed or is, you know, conceived John Connor, which is a great you know, twist in that movie. Um, what, what, what do we think of her being now in a mental institution at the start of this movie? I mean, this is kind of not what you would expect from, you know, from the last movie, you know, uh, cause she's obviously telling government officials that these people came from the future. There's this great event, this judgment day that's going to happen in 97. Um, what do you think of this whole mental institution thing? What do you think, uh, KG? I think it was a smart play because again, when she gets rescued by the cops or whomever comes after they, they catch her in Cyberdyne, She's an escape mental. She says she's a crazy person. If someone said to you, guess what? I was visited by a guy who duped me into fucking him and convincing me as well that I am the mother of the uh, savior of the human race. What's the first <laughs> thing you would do? <laughs> throw her full of Thorazine uh, and, and throw her in a fucking loony bin and just <laughs> observe her. And that's it. That's There is no problem with that storyline. A hundred percent. Cosign on the choice that Cameron made. Definitely. How about you, Ki? If she wasn't in the uh, in the mental institution, you would have never gotten that amazing slow face lick scene that was so incredibly necessary. <laughs> yeah. that, like, wait, oh, oh, watch just, the watch the director's cut because they show more than that. Oh, really? Yeah, it gets. It, they show a lot of shit that gets that. That's weird. They also a, show him killing the dog Wolfie, like killing the fucking dog. He stabs ooh. the dog Wolfie. He gets wow. cut. A lot of shit gets they have and then one more oh, thing yeah. cut too. They have another, you know, when she's playing with John on the playground and the bomb hits on there's that opens up and there's another one of those later on. So they repeat it. So I guess they said we don't need two of these apocalyptic fucking scenes. So but yeah, it's a lot of shit in the in the should have paid the extra four bucks. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I I think I think the I I like when things happen in movies that seem like it's the way things would go in real life. 
Like that makes right. that. I hate when people and we, we talk about this a lot on our podcast. I hate when people behave in movies like you not the way you would in real life. Like when you have a crazy st- when you go through something crazy, like you find out you have superpowers and somebody's just like, I have superpowers. And they're like, no, you don't like in a movie. You would be like, that's not how you would present it. You'd sit him down and be like, I'm about to show you, show you some batshit crazy stuff. I realize it's going to blow your mind, but just be, like do something. And so the idea of her ending up in a mental institution makes complete like that's great. Like she knows about a, an, an apocalypse caused by a AI that leads a robot army in the future. Like you. Yeah. You're like have said, you're going to the crazy place and you're going to stay there for a while. But yeah. the one problem I have with it is that when she's trying to put on the front that she's sane and she's she just like, I just want to see my son. And then when he says no, she snaps. I feel like the character they set her up to be wouldn't have snapped because she knows how to survive and she knows how to get her way. And she would have been like, well, fine. If you, you want me to wait another month, I'll wait another month to prove it. Like she right. had the ability to wait things out and to like see. And I feel like they just needed to. They were like, we need to get this some action so happening. I- I'll, I'll explain yet again. From the director's cut. Another cut scene. Michael Bean was in T2. He visits her in a dream and says, they're coming for him again. You need to protect him. That's why she had oh. the, the the desire. He goes, I got to get out of here, which I think that that's one of the things they should have kept because yeah, they definitely should have kept that. Yeah. yeah. Like they, and they make out and da, 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 da. Oh, he's, you know, they're coming for him again. You need to you need to go get John. You need to protect him. So very. I don't know why they cut that. I thought that was huh. very important. Hmm. No, I could buy the attack from a from a cuckoo's nest perspective, which is to say, if you weren't crazy before you went in, uh, right. <laughs> you'll be crazy <laughs> given a certain amount of time. I don't know if they they really didn't. Uh, uh, Cameron didn't really push that too much, though. So I would say what we saw. I, I you know I can I just rationalized it, but what we saw on the screen, <laughs> I'd agree with Kevin Israel. Uh, and then, well, there is a director's cut, though. I don't know. I mean, a dream. He just comes in a dream. How does that work? Yeah, right after when they have when she has the incident where he goes, uh, she stabbed me in the knee with a pen. That's when she that's when she has that vision of of Kyle Reese coming in her like on your feet, soldier. And you know, they again they make out, they go over like they're coming from again. You need to get out of here and protect John because they're coming from again. So was it suggested that that was actually like a message from the future? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, kind it's kind of like it's kind of like the vi- the visions she sees of the playground and stuff. Yeah. Like when she's watching that, like that's kind of how it's presented. So, like, yeah. I don't know if like, yeah, I just the- assume that's just a nightmare in her own mind based on the information she had, not that she was receiving a message. Nah, but- Kyle Reese's magic sperm gave her the, <laughs> the future. That's <laughs> God. Hey. You guys didn't pick up on that. No, I totally missed it. <laughs> yeah, come on. It's in the uh, it's in the uh, novelization of Terminator Two. So, uh, <laughs> but I think books, guys, uh, before we move too far from this, uh, is I just love the sci-fi aspect of this, I, I, and I love uh, as as we get to later in the film is you know, the the time travel. I think it does a good job of explaining itself. We know what happened in the first one with uh, you know Arnold coming coming to do his job. And then it sort of explains, well, the consequence of that time travel and later on, well, he had a microchip, which then still advanced itself to Skynet. I find this really cool and it might get confusing, especially if you see like the sequel movies, you're like, this is a Kyle Reese and that's John Connor. And I don't fuck all those movies. You know, I I like watching them too. And it might be a little, you know, it might feel a little jumbled or not, but I think this, I I, I love sci-fi and uh, this just uh, always in the back of my mind. It's not just, uh, as we were saying, uh, of the, of the T of the T 1000 chasing them. It's also, they have a greater purpose beyond that too. Cause you, you know, it as, as the audience member is, you know, the consequences here. So I, I think it does a really, really good job of, of laying that it, it grabs you right away. This idea of something coming from the future to try to prevent the apocalypse and hell oh, Skynet, man. It just feels like we're getting, <laughs> we're creeping we're there. closer to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, this 2029 is, what, where we saw the events uh, or the first scene in the movie 1997 yeah. was judgment day but yeah 2029 is when uh i think john connor sends back uh the terminator the the good terminator the good guy arnold uh in this one um and, and the terminator's that, rolling over the skulls and all that i found uh, that terrifies yeah. me yeah that visual was yeah. memorable yeah but it's funny what you say about the the technology aspect of it because so in 2029, 
they had the ability or the Skynet has the ability to make these hyper advanced robot androids that can, you know, greater than man. They can build a liquid metal being, <laughs> but they couldn't have him wirelessly access computers <laughs> in 19. Like he still yeah. had to type in and be like, where could I find like, really? You didn't have like a little thing that pops out of your finger that goes in and be like, oh, I like, know where he is. Okay. Like, like Robocop. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Like that. Like, he, like they couldn't James Cameron could, could envision Android cyborg murdering machines, yeah. but he couldn't think of like a better way to access a computer <laughs> because Wi-Fi wasn't a thing yet. Right, right, yeah. right. He was he was too concerned about the CGI with uh, <laughs> with that uh, you know the liquid character T T one thousand. There we go. That's right. his name. Um, and uh, so yeah, I mean we we we. <laughs> We get to and well, and I also love the aspect of you know the the young John Connor, you know, kind of trying to teach Arnold about feelings and things like you can't you can't just kill people, and then he realizes how he can actually tell him what to do because he is John Connor, and John <laughs> Connor in the future was able to tell him what to do. So I love that. Uh, well, let, let's talk about that for one second. John Connor. Okay, you did John, not love it. No, I, no, John Connor is a fuck boy. All right. Now, this is going to tie in a couple of my points. He calls for help and two bodybuilder dudes come over to help him. Yeah. Then he calls them douches. And then as the cherry on top, he six Arnold on one of them. Now, we just did this film on two, actually two films on our podcast. Did he go all alley with an eye from a karate kid and Lori Singer from Footloose? Did they, they both attend the same school of sick fantasy of getting their men in fight school? Like, all he did was like she must have a hard on for like some fight club bullshit. Like that's <laughs> that's half the argument. The other half is this. Don't you think older John Connor would program the Terminator to listen to about 80 percent of John's commands? Because remember, it's a whiny teenager he's dealing with. Right. Oh, like, like it's like, I don't feel like breaking my mom out of a mental hospital right now. I just want to get high and play PlayStation. <laughs> well, to defend that, I mean, if we're, you know, we go towards the end, I mean, you know, at the end when Terminator, you know, uh, sacrifices himself, essentially, Connor's telling him not to go, but he doesn't listen to him. He says this is the only way, you know, essentially. So maybe he did say to only listen to about 80%, you know? <laughs> Because he's he's trying to stop him, he like he's holding right. him up, and then he finally says, "Let me go," and then he drops him, and that's when he realizes, "Oh, you let well, me I, go." Because... I also think part of that was supposed to be the evolution of the Terminator, because he said, "As I as I'm around people, I become more human, or I, I, I can learn about them." Yeah, and so he saw that like that that self sacrifice was his almost like his step to being human, like that was right. his final action, and now he was human because you see. The movie's all about sacrifice because the sure. the scientist, who by the way is uh, Cyborg's father in Justice League, Justice League I yeah. Know. Uh, so apparently he can and only be the a police scientist. and the no 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 he's also the police captain in Speed. Oh wow! wow. Yes. Good Speaking call. of which, Good we call. were we were just talking about Ghostbusters. I forgot uh, how Reginald. Yes, something. I was going to say this. I was going to say what you were about yeah. to say. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> the family the, matters. Yeah, family matters. Carl. <laughs> Winslow, yeah. Reginald, Guys, Vel, Re Reginald Vel Johnson's his name. Not sure which episode we'll, we'll release first, but hey, we've talked <laughs> with uh, Gutting the Sacred Cow about Ghostbusters, so that's uh, context for you. One, um, <laughs> one, one thing about the time travel, I'm just going to go back for one second. Yeah, This is why this film is so fucking perfect. <clears throat> because they do a good enough job where any of us can explain what happens with John Connor and the Terminators and future in the Skynet. Yeah. The same applies for the matrix. I can explain the matrix to you. I can explain how it works. I can explain time travel. In wait, wait, the wait, wait, can you explain the architect? No, I, I, I put, <laughs> no, no, nobody no, can. <laughs> no, I put that on my mind. The art that hey, the, the matrix two is so bad. Okay. But, and, and, and back to the future one, two and three, I can explain time travel and what happens yeah. with the butterfly effect that they have. But this is why tenant and inception both ate dick. Because no one can explain Inception and no one can explain China. When well, you yeah, do not, that, yeah, not without that, twenty minutes or yeah or thirty. And, minutes and the video. explanation wasn't worth the fucking payoff either. That's why. <laughs> so what's, those what's, films stink, and this the, these films I mentioned are all masterpieces. What's the explanation in T two? Of what? How how the whole the war works and what happens? Yeah. The explanation is it's quite again we we've, we've already said it. They go back in time to prevent the war because of the well, let's go back. 
Skynet is now self-aware. Skynet's going to drop a bomb to kill humanity because humanity tried to kill Skynet. Once they realized they became self-aware, the machine sent back a Terminator, which was the first one, Arnold Schwarzenegger, to kill the mother who's going to lead the resistance. And of course, the second one, the sheet, they, when they failed, they had to go send another one back to go kill John Connor as a teenager when they failed again. The and grand, uh, just a follow-up. Paradox, which just was for- also brought up in Tenet. Uh, which is what? Sorry. The grandfather paradox, which was also brought up in Tenet. But anyways, Dave, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, well I don't, is, is there a grandfather paradox in this? I don't think a so. A little bit, because how does John Connor become who he is to send Kyle Reese back? Because Kyle Reese ends up being his biological Ed. father. So... It, it goes went. multiverse, I guess. That's yes, I mean, exactly. you could get lost in the paradox forever <laughs> yes. because the technology that kills you is based off of that technology. Yeah, like, but and then in this, the technology that made you that conceived you is, right. is based so, I mean, you off could, that. You could, you could, but that, but I will say that th- this and Back to the Future, I think, were the were two of the first really mainstream movies that really popularized kind of time travel yeah and then after those two movies it just became a trope even yeah. in even in uh infinity and uh avengers endgame, endgame. which i love like i i really yeah. wish they didn't go the time travel route i wish yeah. they found some because i just feel like time travel is just such an easy like we'll just go back in time but right. if, yeah. if you set rules and you follow them that's okay like it doesn't have to be like oh yeah this could actually happen in the world but within this world it's coherent and i think it's coherent in this world Right. Yeah, I agree. And so uh, just a quick question. So Arnold died in Terminator. Uh, so what, they found another model and sent him back. Is that I, I just yeah. at that point was OK. They're all they all look, I think they all look like it because remember, it was at Salvation where yeah. it's the same thing. They go get another Arnold off the mm. line and that's where Christian yeah. Bale. But why couldn't they build a Terminator who didn't have an accent? I was just going to say, <laughs> like, why did, did he have do, to have an Austrian accent? Do, like, was that they part ever of the programming? <laughs> Do they is, they it like Bumble, is it like Bumblebee in Transformers who just has to not have a voice? He'd be like, ah, damn it, we can't get this glitch out of his voice vocals. Why do I have to talk like this? I don't know. I'm sorry. Well, we Bumblebee wanted to make you a cool British guy, but this is what you sound like. Bumblebee did speak in the Bumblebee film. Just in the movie, yeah. yeah. In the Bumblebee well, film, yeah. That no one cared to see. Um, no, uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I was, I was wondering the exact same thing. I was wondering if, because I haven't seen all the spinoffs and sequels. I've seen a couple of them. I was wondering if they explained that ever and kind of fixed that, but obviously not. So. Um, but yeah, yeah. Why, why, why does he need an accent? But uh, hey, it's because, Arnold, all right. Uh, because Arnold Schwarzenegger commands enough money that he doesn't have to learn how to speak American English. <laughs> because, because did you want to turn me with the Nero New York accent? No, <laughs> you kind of lose a little bit of it. Right. Or a Matthew McConaughey Texas drawl? No. Or uh, Gal Gadot. Cal- no. Come, come with me if you want to yep. live, all right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or an OJ Simpson. Or no, that's to cool term- too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or an OJ Simpson accent. I know what his accent sounds like, but I know he has a lot of slashing. I know that's all I know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, Norberg. Yeah, well, why is he in DC or Detroit? Well, send him a new pair of pants. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love the uh, juxtaposition of. The future essentially creating John Connor, and then also the future essentially creating Skynet, uh, which we get with Miles Dyson, which we find out is the one who essentially created the technology for Skynet because he found the chip and the arm from the Terminator from the first movie which allowed him to find the technology to create it. Again, another grandfather paradox type thing. Well, that's what's cool because um, you actually yeah. do change the world you're in. Like right. in Back to the Future, I guess to use that as an example because we talked about it, we don't see the after effects of Marty McFly going back. You know, maybe you know something else happened, but they didn't explore. But in this one, it follows up. Yes, it wasn't a clean go back, fix it, and done. No, something was left behind, which still ended up... <laughs> you know catalyzing the thing that you were trying to prevent in the first place so it becomes that that like almost never-ending 
uh, thing. Uh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You mean to tell me that there were not any after effects of Marty McFly going back to the future? How about <laughs> when his old man knocked out Biff and his dad wasn't a pussy in the second half of the first film and he was <laughs> a nerd, a loser, and the, and the sister. Oh, there you go. Yeah, part two. Yeah. And, and the dad, no, that was the first one. And the dad, and the brother wasn't working at Burger King. He was, he was Marty. I always wear a suit to the office. No, man, that, that whole thing changed when he went back to the future. And he the got first the cool one. Toyota pickup truck. Yeah. Okay. Bad example. Sorry. <laughs> another film i've seen 50 to 100 times because yeah. it's perfect no you're right well, but it wasn't like Roasted. it wasn't like uh no but in the in the, in the example for t2 sorry yes of course he yes he made his life better uh but it wasn't like oh i went back and then still you know matter what i did i still gotta go back again because my dad's a loser and or something like that that that, that was my point yeah <laughs> it's uh the time machine you guys ever see that the time yeah. machine with yeah. guy pierce which, which one terrible uh, I, I'm. I'll defend 2003's The Time Machine. Not well, later. I bet. No, probably not. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm sad I brought that up just now. I don't. I don't, uh, know what's I don't remember yeah, it well enough. I just remember the the ending of it is pretty bleak. Yeah, it is. It is very bleak, and uh, I don't know so, something about it. But anyway, just, we're talking T2 or time li- or timeline, which was even worse than Time Machine. Time What's cop. The- Time, no, timeline time with Michael no, Crichton. I'm saying time cop. Oh, that's great. There's, <laughs> there's Times Square. Um, <laughs> there's time. Ta- oh, I thought we were Burger, there's, there's Burger Time, the video game from 1984. Yep. 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 Uh, it's, there's Time to Kill. Yes. You know? Um, so, yeah. So, the rest of the podcast, we're just going to name time uh, <laughs> phrases. Are you know, we going to talk about how bad Dr. Edward Fro- Oh, sorry. Good. Say again. <laughs> No time for love, Doctor Jones. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> oh, very nice. nice. So, Dave, you are a, not a, a Furlong fan, huh? Is anyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's introducing him. You know, I mean, this is his first. Yeah, movie, and then what? You know, uh, he did well, Detroit Rock City. He was American in. American History, History X. X. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, in this movie, you're not a fan of him, Dave. He huh? has this squeak, and yeah, I. I don't like him. I don't. I don't like John. Him. Every John Connors. Every third sentence of his is a scream. Did he go to improv camp after <laughs> Sarah Connor got locked up? <laughs> yes, I believe he did. Yeah, I think that's in the fan fiction yeah. for the uh, for the film. So, and yeah. it's amazing that the scenes with Edward Furlong and Schwarzenegger do so well because. <laughs> Furlong sucks as an actor, <laughs> and and Arnold is you know s- purposely more wooden than he could ever even want to be, uh, but it still works, which is fascinating to me. Yeah, definitely, and yeah, I mean, I I I like their scenes together. I mean, him teaching him, you know, how to smile and everything. I love that scene where he actually <laughs> tries to smile, and it's just like this creepy, you know, just using <laughs> the muscles of his mouth. It's just like, what are you doing? Um, but it was perfect. It was perfect for that moment. But yeah, he, he kind of learns as he goes. And uh, I mean, do, was it a good idea to to turn off that switch uh, in in his his processor that that kind of seemed a little dangerous uh to to uh, do that another deleted scene from the film is when they she takes the cover off she's about to take a mallet and yep. smash him in the fucking head to kill him because she still doesn't trust him yet yep another thing i think they should have kept in there just to show the i'm still waffling on the fence about this fucking guy being and you know what him. and i wish they did to keep that in because yeah. i that was also kind of a problem with like she spent an entire traumatic week or however long that was running from this thing like yeah. that that in, in that experience impacted the entire course of her life yeah. and then she sees this thing and her son's just like he's with me and she's like okay and then she's like, <laughs> like he he'd be a better father than i you know ever would it's like what there's no there was no getting there <laughs> i mean to that to that point I and mean, i guess for the sake of brevity they were just like well if if, it, if it, we show him with the kid that means he hasn't killed the kid which means she should trust him because she knows damn good and well anyone who comes into his way is dead in five seconds ask anyone who stood at tech noir the club in terminator one yeah no i Ooh, and i I, yes, I agree with that, that. true i just think as like somebody who probably has PTSD because of this incredibly traumatic sit. I just feel like there would have been that, that thought of maybe I should just kill this thing would still be there. It's a, it's a great scene. I'm very disappointed to not make the final cut. 
Yeah, so she yeah, she's totally willing to yeah, to try to destroy it, which I I, I watched the director's cut as well, KG. Um and yeah, that uh yeah, I'm I'm shocked that wasn't uh that wasn't in the the, the final cut because yeah, it adds that extra like her not trusting this thing. Again, like Dave said, like or your one of you said, I don't know, I'm talking like eight people here. Uh one of you said, uh you know, it's uh she spent like a week uh, fighting against this thing. Um, so it's like, yeah, why, well, why would it be that easy to, to convince her to, to, dis- to not destroy it? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they, they go on from there and yeah, that's again, when, when, when he learns how to smile and everything and they run into this, this guy, she knew where she ended up hiding weapons and everything. Uh, Eduardo, I believe his name was Enrique, Enrique, en- Enrique. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Enrique. <laughs> thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, she meets up with him, gets new clothes and yeah, she has this whole underground weapons, uh, arsenal uh and yeah they they get a bunch of stuff there Um, one of my favorite scenes well not favorite scenes in the movie but one of the most kind of subtle scenes is when he picks up the chain gun which by the way is the same gun from predator that jesse the body used and he he picks it up and he looks at the camera and he smiles like i know it wasn't intended that but i feel a little part of arnold was like this yeah. was in another movie. I've seen this before. Yep. <laughs> remember <Yeah>. this, folks? <laughs> you remember? Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, she gets all these weapons, and then she has another. Uh, again, this might be in the director's cut. She has another vision when she's at that picnic table, <laughs> um, and it, yeah, it's like a total nuclear holocaust type thing, and she gets destroyed and gets caught him is that director scott kg yeah yeah yeah. okay i also love that that, well that whole scene is when john goes why why russia aren't they our friends now no john they're not and the chinese someone sends someone back in time to take out that regime as well as that guy in north korea while you're at it that should be the uh (laughs) the the fifth terminator sequel whatever we have here Man, yeah, so much, so so much there, so, so much there to pick apart. Is there anything um, to pick apart with Linda Linda Hamilton's performance? I thought she was just incredible. I have written the following: she is the original Letty from Fast and the Furious. Like, if you have a female badass, that is who you modeled after. And I also put her as leader in the clubhouse as woman who can strike a match using only her pussy lips. That's the kind of tough broad she is. <laughs> but that is, yeah. Yeah, that's very well put. Very descriptive. And um, <laughs> he's a wordsmith. I try. <laughs> he, she it's was still, she was absolutely it. shredded for this movie. I yeah. feel like she 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 was like I'm gonna get as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger. Was well, she's cape movie. she's cape fearing it at the beginning. She's yeah. <laughs> totally doing you know uh, in the jail doing her uh, pull ups and everything, just missing the tattoos and everything and, and the, the laugh yeah, and the in the in the southern draw. You know the hey counselor. Uh, that's that's all she was missing. But uh, in the same year, actually ninety one. So. I don't know if you guys have, uh, if you're familiar with the Critical Drinker on YouTube, but uh, he did a, a a little lampooning of Terminator Genesis, comparing uh, Linda Hamilton to Amelia Clark, and wow, it's uh, quite the contrast. <laughs> yeah, she the new the last sequel, which was fucking awful. Uh, poor uh, Linda Hamilton has not aged that well. If you there's there's She's only two good Terminator now? films. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, she's got to be, yeah, pushing, pushing 70 at least. Um, I don't know what it is about Schwarzenegger and like when they try to do, when they try to franchise his movies, but like Terminator, they should have never gone beyond two. Predator, they should have never gone beyond one. Yeah. Two was okay. <laughs> it was bad, but was he into? In it. No, no. It was, yeah, that was Danny insane. Glover yeah. and Gary yeah. Busey. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> and and then and like did they just and then those two franchises just keep getting worse and worse and worse with every movie. And every time the movie comes out, they're like, no, this one's gonna correct it. I swear <laughs> it's gonna get better. And then it just like bleh. Yeah. <laughs> Not so much. Um so uh Sarah Connor decides to go off and uh on her own and uh assassinate Dyson. Because he's the one who created Skynet, destroys Skynet, and hey, none of this ever happens. 
And, uh, yeah, and accidentally so, yeah. too, which I like the good for the character. You know, he doesn't really know what he's doing, right? He's just right. Oh. Yeah. Working. Yeah, he's not malicious or anything. Like, yeah, I like just, that. I like that characterization. Yeah, like shows he's a family man, and you know, saying how you know you can have pilots who won't get tired, and you know, can just fly the planes and all that. Um, so yeah, definitely a good character, innocent and everything. And then you know, Linda Hamilton realizes that as well. Uh, you know, obviously she tries to shoot him, but uh, uh, Arnold and she uh, did shoot him. She yeah she she yeah. did shoot him I should I should have said try to kill him she did not <laughs> unsuccessfully she yeah just shot him in the arm and yeah they they tell him the story like hey this is what's gonna happen this is what we need to do and yeah they break into the uh, the Cyberdyne Systems headquarters yep and uh, get and I like more. before that how Arnold pulled he cuts his that's, skin off I was gonna get that yeah uh, my yeah. favorite scene in the movie. Yeah, and that's that scene it's the most real yeah like you building up to that and like just they and he did such a good job reacting to it like the, i can i can still hear the wife being like no 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 when she starts cutting it open and then you see the the arm and that arm is so identifiable yeah, yeah. right yeah well, yeah, because, I mean, he's seen it, obviously, you know, they show uh, in, you know, an earlier scene, you know, that he's he's there at Cyberdyne. And, yeah, you see you see the processor and then you see the arm. So he's like, oh, I know what this is. It's funny how uh, what saved his life was a remote control truck. And I just want to say I miss remote control cars. How about you guys? <laughs> they were the best. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't they? I mean, they're still they're still around, I think. But yeah, I want one I mean, that could survive a jump off those stairs. <laughs> yeah, that the was truck. a that was a good one. Speaking yeah. of trucks, I love the set piece when T one thousand is chasing them with the semi truck. I mean, oh there's that's I mean, iconic. That's, yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's just yeah, great. And then he yeah, that it blows up, but then he walks through the walks through the flames. Such an iconic moment in film. Um, but yeah, they have to go to Cyberdyne and destroy everything. Uh, they get there and have to in uh, duct tape the uh, the security guard and everything. Um, and you know they uh, they they get to get to the main place where everything is and they set up somehow they get the detonator stuff and everything uh, with uh, we're at the with place the... where they do the thing and then we gotta shoot it <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's a it's it's like a video game you know this is our next mission and you know this is, this is you, so... you said you said video game t2 rk game fucking amazing yes i don't Such remember a... that what? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't, don't remember think the game. It was a game yeah. the two guns, and it was a first person. Oh shooter. yeah, yeah. game was. I have I have it on Super it's Nintendo, like, and it's fucking amazing. Oh, and it, 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 it has voice in there too. Yeah, it had that. That was good. <laughs> oh man, can I, we uh, can we can we just give some love to Guns and Roses? You could be mine. Love it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, so or we can phone. give love to the, your phone call. Oh, you're dare you right that. now. Um, hello. Uh, <laughs> we're taking calls in the air. Hello, caller. First yeah. time in a long time. <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> Is it Edward Furlong calling and going, Stop making fun of me, you yeah. fucks? Hey, Fuck guys, you. come on. I was going through puberty. <laughs> Will you accept a, a collect call from <laughs> rehab? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he had, he went to rehab. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's on the a, lo- a lot. A right, lot. <laughs> and you yeah. know what? He should have went to food rehab too because he's the size of a fucking house. <laughs> Seriously, Google him right now. He is a fat fucker. Oh man, yeah. I was uh, I was gonna look to see if we, he would come on tonight, but yeah, well, uh, no. burn, 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 burn. he uses phone call. He uses phone calls up for the day in the in the in the cell block. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's take a look here. Um, yeah, he's not looking so hot. Ooh. But uh, Dyson ends up being <laughs> a little bit heroic. Well, well, I mean, what do we think? Of, you know, the cops show up at Cyberdyne and everything. And then, uh, you know, uh, Furlong reminds him to don't kill anybody. So he just starts blowing up cop cars and then just more right. cops come. And it's like, OK, what was the point of that? Was well, that somebody? Was, yeah, I, I was thinking that, too, because I was like, I guess maybe his aim is so good that he knows where to put those. Bull- but it's a fucking Gatling gun. Yeah, <laughs> actually, they call it a, it's a. He goes, it's a damn minigun. Like, how do you, how can you call it a minigun when it's the size of a Shetland pony? I mean, hey. <laughs> By the way, fun fact: another one. When the, when the SWAT team came in, and Dyson drops the bomb. Do you know who that SWAT team leader is? Uh, Why don't you tell me? 
Okay, smart ass. Now I'm not going to. <laughs> it is Hank from Breaking Bad, the second Schwarzenegger I... film he's in. Ooh, oh, really? I did he not was know in that. Total Re- he was in Total Recall. He had the weird thing in her face. Yeah. He goes, look who's talking, Hauser, right next to the, the, the chick with the three tits. The yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's his name is Dean Moore. But you hear that go because I'm going to watch it the day I hear him go that and you can kind of sort of see through the mask a little bit. I go, that looks like fucking Hank fucking IMDb two seconds later. Yes, it is. So, wow, that's yeah, funny because I saw Total Recall like a couple of months ago just to rewatch it for the hell of it. I'm like, that's Dean Norris. That's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> also in Above the Law is Steven Seagal. He's one of the bad guys. Oh, oh no, wow. hard to kill, hard to kill, hard to kill. Sorry. Oh, hard to kill. OK, yeah, few do a big difference. Seagal movie. <laughs> a little bit uh i mean then you got the you know so yeah dyson kind of does the heroic thing like he knows he believes what's going to happen in the future and you know he he even is heroic to the cops who come and try to try to get him because he's holding this heavy processor thing above the detonator and he's like i don't know how long am I, uh, how much longer i can handle it and uh or hold it and you know he does the heroic thing by letting them go uh but uh yeah he sacrifices himself to destroy everything in that lab uh which uh yeah i thought was a great scene but you get T-1000 stealing the helicopter, which was another great set piece of the helicopter chasing them in the truck, uh, which a lot of it looked practical, like in actual effects, like it, I believe. <laughs> like, I think it was. I think that yeah. was all. Yeah. Yeah. The helicopter totally looked like it was about to hit the overpass and then like flew up on, you know, uh, right above it. Like that was... I believe I believe that was 100 percent real. One so thing, that was... one thing with the the helicopter pilot. That's the last person you want to be for that one moment because <laughs> you have a choice. You were told to get out by a fucking thing that bashed his head into the windshield <laughs> of the cockpit, and then face certain death, or do you do what he says and then jump out 50 ish feet? <laughs> and land on a cop car. I think hope for did. the best. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's like, what are you gonna do? You're truly fucked. Like, what do you? I do? mean, they. Yeah, they never show what what happened to him. So you know, I nothing mean, good. No, yeah. <laughs> no, paralyzed for life or or just dead. You know. So uh, you know what's so, funny though, and this this I thought this was kind of interesting. I feel like the terminator the liquid terminator like what was he t2000 whatever t1000 t1000 i feel like he wouldn't have killed as many people as he did i feel like he was he was there to do a single job he was there to kill john connor and he caused a lot more problems for himself with all the murdering and mayhem that he caused I feel like he would have. They would have programmed it to be much more surgical about it. I, I'm going to disagree on one point, and this is actually ties in with one of the scenes. Right when they crashed that truck, the guy goes, "Hey man, are you all right?" And he just fucking knifes him. It's just like you could have just like kind of pushed him aside. That guy wasn't stopping anybody. He was going to try to impede his progress. He just fucking knifes him, and that's no. It. I know, and I get, I get that that's how he was programmed to behave. But I feel like these this brilliant artificial intelligence in the future who can see like everything and plan it out would have probably been like, I should make a more surgical mindset in this thing because he needs to get in there and, and kill this kid and, and not like make a whole thing out of it. Cause the bigger, the bigger of a, of a situation it becomes the more difficult difficulty he's going to have. But he tries to do some detective work in the beginning. He wasn't going around slashing everybody. Right. I mean, he, poses as a cop literally the the, as soon as something happens he grabs a kid and like throws him out of the way and go to the arcade like he didn't need to do that either (laughs) no he didn't i mean i guess you just say he's just so well we have to we have to be afraid of this character i guess no 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 i get i get but yeah no i would it would have been better if he uh, that makes more sense yeah but we wouldn't have nearly the explosions and no it wouldn't have been better for the movie (laughs) the movie was great the way it was i'm not saying james cameron should have been (laughs) I like how he lit up that nerd, that that Louis Skolnick looking motherfucker in the hallway of the mall where he's got the Pepsi can. He's like, wait, 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 you can't be here. That guy doesn't just stand there. He goes, maybe I should probably just stop, drop and roll. And he just gets fucking tuned right up. (laughs) That's zero fucks given right there, guys. Yeah. So, Kevin, you think he would have been more successful if he kept a low profile and was more ninja like? I, I mean, I, I think so. I think it would have been a much less interesting movie. Like if he was just hiding in the bush and <laughs> Connor walked by and he was like, <laughs> and it was just 
like James a Cameron. ninja. <laughs> yeah. All right, movie over. And you just see Arnold walk up, and there's John Connor dead, and be like, "I fucked up." <laughs> Sorry, gay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, the other helicopter scene and everything, and then they get uh, obviously to a steel mill, which has you know hot lava and everything. I mean, naturally, and T one thousand ends up driving a gas truck or whatever was in it's there. It's full of refrigerant. Obviously, <laughs> liquid <laughs> nitrogen. Yeah, liquid nitrogen. So uh, I failed chemistry. So why does he freeze up? What 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 makes him freeze? Because if he's if he was liquid metal, yeah. and he they that that liquid nitrogen gets to such a cold temperature that it would just start to. I mean, if you touch liquid nitrogen, you're done. Yeah, you it's would. Absolute, you, I mean, it's it would, absolute it would zero. Yeah. So it just it just turned him into. It basically made him solid. Yep. Like his his he just became a solid chunk of ice. I'm surrounded by a bunch of nerds. Um, and, uh, and I I thought so. I I I I figured. I was just making sure you guys knew, <laughs> and you do. So good, quiz, good job. Good quiz. Well done. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you get the whole the you know final scene in the in the steel mill. Uh, you know the T one thousand trying to get them and them trying to get away. You get T one thousand and and uh, Arnold squaring off, and you know it looks like T one thousand gets the best of him because he got Arnold he gets his arm like in that gear thing and it gets ripped off. And yeah, it's just uh, a moment where you're like, oh, come on. Because again, we're, we're thinking of 1984 and Arnold was the bad guy. And now we're like, oh, man, I want him to win. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, he gets the best of them. He quote unquote kills him uh, by sticking a, a big old big old metal rod into him. And, you know, that's it. He, he powers down and he's gone. He's gone. But guess what, guys? <laughs> he'll be back. There, he'll be back. Uh, oh, that's what, one thing before that. Yeah, when he shoots uh, the frozen, because I like the word light nitrogen when it gets uh, really cold. Uh, you know, it. Uh, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you, you get the famous line, hasta la vista, baby. Yeah. You know, which... Furlong teaches him John Connor. Sorry, which Dave loves. Dave love. Dave loves uh, Furlong. Love him. Well, I mean, <laughs> you guys were all. I think we're all roughly the same same age or generation. I mean, how much we had to suffer through countless reiterations of Asta La Vista, baby, through <laughs> <laughs> our childhood and teenage years. Yeah. Goodness yeah. gracious. <laughs> The one, the really, the glaring problem I had with this film, and I called this in the theater, and I, I'm floored they did not implement this for T3, is if he had to destroy everything so there would be no, no more Terminators at all, explain to me how they did not use his other crushed arm in those gears and use that as their escape clause great for point. T3. It's a great point. I, I, I'm sitting there, the, the, the fucking arm's in the gear. Like, what are you? There's T3. This is perfect. And then. Yeah. Oh, so be, much be in the same good. way that they found the chip from before. That would why not do the same thing again? Yeah, yeah, yep. because uh, you didn't write it, KG. Well, were they yeah, planning? Were, was Cameron planning three? But like he he didn't do three. It was no, he didn't. But was he planning it to, to do it himself, or was that? I I mean, when, when it makes like five hundred fucking million dollars in nineteen ninety one, you better you better be, like, believe that they're yeah, so, for a well, sequel. Was, so. Was his next project uh, Titanic? True Lies. No, True Lies. Oh. True Lies is 94, without even looking. 93 or 90, 94, I think. Or 95. 94, I think. He doesn't even have to look. And then Titanic was 97. I remember that because it's fucking... Yeah. But yeah, True Lies was Avatar. definitely 92, 93, 94, 95, or 96. So I mean, it, was, <laughs> it was within that range. That's for sure. You let, know, let, so. Let's also have a moment of honesty here. You guys are fucking liars. If Why? you did not tear up a bit when he went down in the lava and gave the thumbs, of course, up. yeah, of course, still got, still got me on Saturday, still got me. Like, of course, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's just like, oh man, he, he oh, 
what you, if I what if I chuckled? Well, you're, you're a monster. Inside. <laughs> <laughs> You're a monster. I'm going to call a Dyfus on you. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> you need therapy. Dave chuckled. chuckled. I mean, it's... I don't know if it's because know, it's, a, it's become a meme or not. Maybe that was it. But just kind of see it. It was like... Uh, <laughs> it's just like a kid. Yeah. The internet's ruined you. Yeah, it has. <laughs> it's also ruined Homer Simpson going in a bush, too. That's yeah. true. <laughs> he innocently, innocently was just going into that bush, and now you know we all make you know jokes about it. But uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you get the 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 thumbs up thing, which is you know I think a sign of him uh, I, that these things have artificial intelligence. They they are sentient, uh, or they can be sentient, which is a great. Uh, you know, thing to explore. I love that whole thing in sci-fi. I love those kind of movies, the Blade Runner, you know, everything like that. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's very sad and I just get choked up every time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you get to him being selfless and yeah, it's just such a great, a great duo of a movie, but, uh, I do want to ask you guys, <sighs> I, I know the answer, but T T T one or T two? What's what are you going with? It's T two. It's not. It, it's close, but not. It's a respectable win. It's not a landslide. It's not a nail biter. I mean, I give I, I give T two a nine out of ten. I give T two Terminator one, Terminator seven. Yeah, maybe seven and a half. What about you, K I? I, I agree. I think Terminator 1 is kind of a, a very direct line movie. Like like I said before, it's just her running from it's just them running from the Terminator trying to stay alive. This movie has a lot more facets in it and there's a yeah. lot more I think you like humanity in it. You see, you know, you see the um Dyson, he sacrificed. There's a lot of there's a lot of theme I started to say before. There's a lot of theme of sacrifice. He sacrifices himself when he realizes that he's Although good intentioned, he ends up creating a monster. And then the monster that he creates indirectly ends up sacrificing itself for humans. So there's there's just there's a lot more like meaning and nuance to T2 than T1. T1 is an awesome action movie. It's an awesome, fun action movie. But T2 is like it's got a lot more depth to it. It's what about you, Dave? I I agree. I think T2 is a better movie. I agree with uh, KI that uh T1 is a is a much more straightforward movie. For me, what I like the most about T2 is this idea in my mind that we're always our characters are fighting something to try to stop an inevitability from happening, right? We're we're battling against this technology which is racing forward and we and we it seems like in every iteration it results in the same thing, which is you know the rise of the machines and the destruction of humanity. And how do you fight that and continually fight it? And I think that's kind of always in my mind when I'm watching this movie. I start contemplating that. Uh, so I think that sort of bigger philosophical question, I guess, if you want to call it that, uh, that's a, I think it's much makes it a much deeper movie. So those are my thoughts. Well, and there's there's a that great scene with with the Terminator and the little kids shooting at each other, and John Connor looks and goes, "We're doomed," or like this, "We're, we're yeah. bound to let this happen." And and Terminator basically says something like you you insist on killing yourselves or something like that. And it's like it's very so it's very like introspective of what the movie is trying to say about yep, humanity. Yep, exactly. Not even. And as we said uh, with the um, with the Joe Martin character, not even intentionally. We're just pushing towards this thing that yep. will inevitably uh, re lead to our destruction and how do we fight against it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause it's just a couple of kids fighting guns, but like inevitably. Yeah. I mean, that's essentially what we're, what, what we're talking about here. Right. You got these two kids just playing guns, but they're still trying to destroy each other in their game. You know, it's, it's whoever, you know, king of the hill you know whoever ends up on top sort of thing so i love the themes i wish it you know I, I always like when it dives into that kind of theme a little bit more you know obviously this movie's action-packed and everything wish it would have gotten into it a little more but yeah i mean t2 for me yeah, is, is above t1 but very close margin for me um on this show we haven't done this in a while because usually you know uh if a guest picks a show you know they're always going to say oh five and five uh but uh, 
uh, but I think you guys will be more a little bit more honest. We we grade movies on two aspects: uh, stars and buckets of popcorn. Uh, so stars is like it's it's cinematic value, like your Godfathers, your Citizen Canes for some people, whereas buckets of popcorn are your you know your your Jurassic Parks, your entertaining movie, your Jurassic Parks, your uh, Step maybe Brothers. comedies, Step <laughs> Brothers, yeah, horrible so, like, film. Yeah, exactly. So, like your your entertainment value. There's something that makes you laugh or whatever. Yeah. So, 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 Dave, why don't you kick us off with this? Uh, what would you give this movie out of five stars and five buckets of popcorn? So, a quality rating being stars, I would say this is a four out of five movie. It's really good, and <laughs> like, there's really not a lot a lot wrong with this movie. It's got great themes. The actors are really good. Even annoying Edward Furlong. He is annoying, but it still comes off good. Arnold's great. Really good. So I'd say four out of five. In terms of entertainment, I mean, other than, you know, to take myself back to 1991, the endless... uh, uh, liquid metal splittings and reformings uh it's hard to judge it uh i guess on that but if i'm going back to 1991 this is basically a five bucket of popcorn movie so i'm gonna go four and five i'm just gonna stick with it i'm gonna pretend that i was sitting there in 1991 Uh, i wasn't but i'm gonna pretend that i was there so i'm gonna say five stars i'm sorry four stars and five buckets of popcorn which kevin wants to take this first you go kevin israel i'd go four and a half stars um I, i mean this movie cinematically it it set up an entire genre of movies that followed it and chased it for still or is or chasing it from not and from a special effects pe- point of view yeah from a storytelling point of view from an action point of view i mean this movie is like the grandfather of so many other movies that we've seen so many blockbusters like it's i mean obviously cinematic like if you're talking about like giant like you know, it's an action movie. It's a, it's a really good action movie that does have some deep themes, but the importance of it in the movie genre and, and, and in, in popcorn movies to come is it's indisputable. So I think it's four and a half and popcorn wise, I think it's five. I mean, this movie, I, ju- I just watched this again. I have like, I, I haven't seen it recently and I, in, I enjoyed every minute of this movie. It grabs you right away. Yeah. I'm going to go for the popcorn first. I mean, Kevin is able to put it so succinctly. You're right. This is the granddaddy of them all. This is the Rose Bowl of time travel films that's not Back to the Future, where it's not, you know, Back to the Future is a nice, fun, family ish film. This is bad shit happening nonstop. And I don't know how many other films try replicating time travel. How many of them gotten even remotely close, especially with alternate universes? I mean, are we going to – The Matrix? Can we call that? Yeah. One like that? That's it. Yeah. I sure shit can't think of any, and I'm willing to entertain all all offers on that. So that's a five. That's a no-brainer five. And especially for the special, tech, uh, the special effects technology, quite the opposite of Ghostbusters, mind you. Call back. <laughs> this revolutionized special effects. I know. <laughs> just going to jag that wooden stake right through your heart, Kevin. <laughs> this, that's a five for that. As for what was the, the, the first criteria was uh, what cultural importance? Well, just or quality. Just cinem- stars, yeah. in, uh, stars in terms of cinematic quality. Stars and cinematic quality. I mean, Schwarzenegger, that's from the mid to late 80s. To, I mean, fuck it. It's even the mid 90s. Who was a bigger action star than Schwarzenegger? I mean, you want to call Stallone or Van Damme or Seagal? I, the closest I could even think of is Stallone, and that's Demolition yeah. Man. And that's pretty much it for him. So just one film. But Schwarzenegger was the fucking undisputed king. Right off that, you have to give him four stars alone just for the gravitas and and the legend and the swagger he brought to all these action films. Now, the other character is a bunch of unheards, which is fine. You don't need, you know, the expendables in every fucking film. So uh, I got it. You know what? I'm going to, sorry, Kev, I'm going to copy you. Four and a half. I mean, Schwarzenegger in his prime, shit blowing up, smartly written script. What the fuck else can you ask for? (laughs) Very true. Ben, what do you Uh, got? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, not to uh, beat a dead horse, but yeah, amazing. Uh, the popcorn value is just amazing. I'll go four and a half pop- 
popcorn. And uh, I'm going three and a half stars just because I wanted them to, you know, uh, be a little less uh, action packed, a little more on the uh philosoph- philosophical side philosophical is that a word yeah philip phil- 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 yeah i, I got, got the word it right okay yeah yeah edit that in post got it <laughs> no i don't edit so uh no <laughs> dave always laughs at my misinterpretations <laughs> and my insecurity uh my um well, he's he's got got snowball, so. <laughs> yeah uh three and a half stars uh yeah again i i wanted to see more of uh, I, I, they could have went more on, you know, what, what these artificial intelligence could do to us, what these machines could do to humankind in the future. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, three and a half, still a good score for me. And yeah, four and a half buckets of popcorn. You can't be bored watching this at all. So there you have it. T2 ju- Judgment Day, joined by Kevin Israel, Kevin Goatee by, uh, from the guys from, uh, Gutting the Sacred Cow definitely check them out guys when do episodes drop where can they find you on social media give us all the deets every monday new episodes drop gtsc podcast on twitter gutting the sacred cow instagram facebook tumblr and uh <laughs> oh, yeah tiktok what the hell because you can just copy and paste from instagram it's pretty easy gutting the sacred cow.com <laughs> has everything you need to know all the links for all the different podcast platforms you can think of blogs every monday through friday and again our merch store has all that and then some and you can find me at kevin goatee.com k-e-v-i-n-g-o-o-t-e-e.com and on twitter the same as well kevin israel.com and kevin israel underscore nj on twitter um and i have a comedy album out called the struggle is real that you can get on itunes Bada bing, bada boom. And thanks there for having us, guys. This was hey, yes, fun. Thanks for having thanks. us. Thanks Good for making time. me watch this movie again. I forgot how much it was. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Great time. Absolute pleasure on my end. Likewise. There you have it. There you have it again. Uh, Judgment Day, Kevin Israel, Kevin Goatee. Make sure you're following them and listening to their podcast, Gutting the Sacred Cow. Hope you really enjoyed it and hope you enjoyed them. They're great guys and uh, looking forward to keep in touch with them. Again, be sure you're following us on on iTunes, subscribing, rating, review, uh, reviewing, and all that. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at BlockbusterCast and Instagram at Blockbuster Mentality. That's where you're going to get updates on when new shows release and everything like that. And we got more exciting guests coming up, so stay tuned. But uh, anyways, that is it uh, for me, for Dave, Kevin, and Kevin, I'm Ben. And as always, grab some popcorn, grab some snacks. We'll catch you guys at the movies. Movies.